Good afternoon. Sorry for the sorry for the d delay. We're waiting on uh, Representative Mitchell, and he'll be here in a few minutes. But uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, today, um, I filed uh, an amendment to Senate Bill One, which would uh, reflect um, much of the work uh, that has gone on um, over the course of many months, uh, back to when uh, the Senate passed Senate Bill Sixteen, I believe, on May the twenty seventh of twenty fourteen. So uh, I want to quickly rewind the clock and just go through some of the brief history of, of the issue, uh, how we got to this point, uh, where we are today in the legislative process, and uh, Representative Davis and Mitchell and myself and Representative Scheer, anybody else who might pop in, um, we'd like to share our thoughts on, on where we think the issue is moving forward, uh, given uh, the fact that we're beginning um, our session uh, here this week. So uh, I want to rewind the clock back to um, 2013 when the General Assembly came into office uh, following the 2012 election. There was a process in the Senate that took place uh, that opened up a conversation that now I think it's safe to argue is being engaged by nearly every superintendent in the state, which is a good thing in my book. Uh, it was a transparent process. It was open. It uh, set up uh, what I think is, is a good thing, which is open dialogue between the legislature and organizations and school districts, educators, superintendents across the state on how we solve uh, what I think is a major problem in the state of Illinois and one that continues to grow absent of action from the legislature. So we went through that process in the Senate. Uh, we came up with uh, what was a, a bipartisan report. Uh, we put a timeline on ourselves, and, and I know many in this room have heard me say this, but I'm going to say it again because I think it's important. Uh, the Senate said we had to produce a report by uh, February 1st of 2014, and we succeeded. And I compliment uh, the eight members of the EFAC committee, Democrats and Republicans, for putting their time and effort into that process. That translated into Senate Bill 16. Senate Bill 16, of course, uh, was was filed about two months before the Senate voted on it so that um, everybody in the state would have uh, plenty of time to read the bill, understand its uh, intentions, understand its effects, and give constructive feedback and con constructive criticism. The Senate passed the bill on May the 27th, and here we are today with a new uh, set of language that's intended to address uh, much of the criticism that has come our way as sponsors of the bill and hopefully set forward a path uh, for bringing about a major reform effort in the state of Illinois, a bill that can be bipartisan and one that ultimately Governor Rauner can, can sign into law. So I want to go, I want to just do a little bit of classroom work here with everybody. Remember this chart? This was the first chart that we used uh, when the bill was introduced in April of 2014. And it shows simply that. 44% of our money is spent on programs where need, some sort of need is used as a criteria for how money is, is, is distributed from the state budget to the 860 plus school districts in the state. That was a snapshot in time when Senate Bill 16 was introduced in the Senate last year. Despite the fact, and this is an important point, despite the fact that, that the current budget increased investment in education, that number has gone down. It's gone down to about 43.2%, which means that less of a percentage of money that we budget in the state budget this year, despite the fact that we've increased spending for K through 12 education, is being distributed based on need, which means that the neediest districts, those that have the highest rates of poverty and oftentimes the highest rates of taxes, are accessing less money in the state budget, which is opposite of what every expert that we heard from in the Senate and every expert that I would suspect the House has heard from is saying we ought to do as a state. So the path forward, we believe, is Senate Bill 1. And we believe that the path forward can begin with a conversation early this session, which is why we're uh, filing the language today early in the process. Uh, because again, an open and transparent discussion is, is vital, it's imperative to this conversation. And we stand continued uh, to, uh, to take in feedback and take in suggestions from any member of the legislature of either party, from any part of the state, from any educator that has an idea 
on how to get at this problem and how to get at the gaping inequities that exist today in public schools. So real quick, Senate Bill 16 uh, would have accomplished these things, and these things are all uh, incorporated into now Senate Bill 1. It would have created a single need-based funding formula, a primary state aid formula, which was a suggestion uh, that, was, that was brought to us uh, from other states and from experts in the Senate, uh, replacing our outdated grant-based system uh, that exists today in Illinois and that hasn't changed sizably since 1997. We would prioritize state resources to help school districts and students who need them the most. That would be the criteria for how we distribute money. We would weight that heavily in the formula, which means that we would send money first to districts that can't afford to provide uh, an education, a basic education, on their own. We would increase transparency by requiring individual school districts to account for how they spend state funds, replacing the old reporting system that exists today. And we would include all districts, including uh, Chicago Public Schools, in a need-based formula that would be a statewide uh, formula to serve every district in the state, regardless of where it is or the size or the makeup of that district. Here are a couple of changes that I think uh, deserve to be mentioned today. Again, these are based off of feedback from members of the House, to, uh, three of which are here today, uh, members in the Senate, such as Senator Lightford, and others across the state that have been part of this discussion moving forward. Uh, one thing we um, explored in the EFAC hearings was uh, coming up with a regionalization of, uh, of funding in the state because Illinois is a complex, uh, very diverse state, and other states have gone to this. So we've incorporated into the language a regionalization approach when it comes to state aid for schools. Uh, it's a fact that it costs more to hire a teacher in one part of the state uh, as opposed to another. And other states such as Maryland and Minnesota, Massachusetts, and others have incorporated this into their state aid formula, and it more accurately reflects the challenges of districts. So that proposal is contained in Senate Bill 1. We would, we would keep the current low-income calculation. Uh, during the course of the debate of Senate Bill 16, there was much feedback from superintendents in the state that questioned the methodology uh, that was employed in Senate Bill 16. Uh, they also coincidentally questioned the methodology, methodology that we use today uh, to, um, to assess poverty. Uh, so we're going to uh, propose this language to try to address that valid point that was made. Much has been made, uh, number three, much has been made of what is adequate. Uh, much of our discussion has uh, revolved around um, the debate about what is an adequate level of spending for schools. So in the new bill, in Senate Bill 1, we will move that study up so we can determine that uh, that, that I would hope would set us on a positive path forward uh, for many years to come so that we can determine uh, using uh, advice from experts, uh, using feedback from educators, what is an adequate level of spending for public education in the state. And, and right now we all know that we are way below where we ought to be. Uh, but moving the adequacy study up in the bill I think would set us on a good framework for a very long-term solution to the problems that we face. Another change that we're uh, proposing in Senate Bill 1 <coughs> is that we would uh, provide additional funding for districts that are collecting taxes or uh, uh, assessing taxes at or above state averages but are spending below the calculated adequacy target for a school. So we have districts in the state that are more than uh, providing uh, their share of funding through their tax rate. But we have a set of districts that also were adversely affected by Senate Bill 16. And these districts are, are um, <coughs> ones that have any number of challenges. So we will provide in this bill a targeted hold harmless for these districts to make sure that they are at the minimum level of adequacy moving forward and that they are not uh, negatively impacted by the changes that we're contemplating. This has a price tag associated with it. So um, unlike Senate Bill 16, um, we are acknowledging that there needs to be money invested in a targeted way to the poorest school districts uh, that are taxing themselves as a, at a rate higher than the state average moving forward so that they're held harmless uh, from any changes in the bill. There's a couple more reporting things. You see those on your sheet. But I want to diverge quickly from the conversation and then turn it over to uh, Representative Davis, the House sponsor. Another thing that we're asking for today um, as, as members of the legislature 
is, um, I would say, echoing the direction that the State Board of Education took uh, a few weeks ago when they produced um, under, um, under the, the new board chairman, acting board chairman, a recommended budget for the legislature and for the governor to take a look at this session. And uh, they recommended a dramatic increase in spending for schools. So we today want to um, echo those sentiments from, from the state board. And we feel that there should be a minimum, a minimum of $500 million associated with this bill to invest in a new formula that drives resources to the neediest districts first. That is a different conversation than we had with Senate Bill 16. But talking with my colleagues and talking with others in the legislature, we believe the time is now to take two steps to uh, make sizable fixes to the challenges we face in the state when it comes to public education. We have to acknowledge that we have gaping inequities that can be solved by reforming the formula and can also be solved by increasing investment at the state time, at, at the same time, some of which will go to what I mentioned in the targeted hold harmless. The rest of it ought to go to an increased investment, which again is what uh, the State Board of Education called for a few weeks ago when they met and released the budget. So that's the overview of the bill. Uh, I, have, I, I, for one, and I'm one of 59 in the Senate, and um, there's 118 members in the House. I don't hear too many people saying today that the system that exists, the status quo, uh, that we own today as a state is sufficient for our purposes moving forward. What we need is an active discussion from both parties, uh, from all parts of the state, uh, from individuals, legislators, teachers, superintendents, uh, interest groups, uh, community groups who want to be part of a discussion on how we advance a bill this session that can begin to be phased in in the coming school year that accomplishes two things. Changes the formula to match the needs of the state today, not the needs of the state almost 20 years ago, and brings about a new level of investment in public education. That to me is the recipe for success. That to me is the recipe to turn around uh, the path that we're on. Because remember, this number is lower today than it was a year ago. The neediest districts are accessing less money today than it was a, than they were a year ago. Absent of change, that's the path we're on. So we should expect next year that number is going to be lower if the legislature doesn't do the right thing and change the law and invest more. So with that, I'll turn, uh, turn the mic over to the House sponsor, uh, Representative Davis. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Senator Menar. I want to begin by first acknowledging all the hard work that Senator Menar and the Senate EFAC committee have put into getting us to where we are. Um, Senate Bill 16 was a great first step. It really allowed us to examine and to acknowledge a lot of the challenges, the challenges that exist as it relates to school funding throughout the entire state of Illinois. One theme that we heard over and over again in the conversation about Senate Bill 16 was there also needed to be a conversation about more revenue, about more resources. So to the Senator's credit, as he examined all of the conversation that was had and took place through not only the hearings, but also town hall meetings that were held all over the state. Uh, I held one in the uh, 30th district where uh, I'm the representative and we heard some of those concerns loud and clear as well as in our offices that yes we can talk about taking what we have and redistributing that but there are still challenges that we've all acknowledged for the need for more revenue to be a part of the conversation. So I'm happy that we have evolved this conversation up to this point to say, yes, we need to add reform, but we also need to talk about more money as well. Uh, and that's an important part of the conversation that, that we heard uh, loud and clear. The House hearing that we had back during veto session, many of the superintendents that sat at the table and talked, all talked about, well, let's do adequacy first. Well, I believe we are smart enough to be able to handle both of these at the same time, but their concern about adequacy was heard loud and clear. And again, as the Senator has already stated, what we're going to do is talk about reform and adequacy in the same conversation, moving them both forward so that we can work to make sure, as we all, I think, as senators and representatives want, to make sure that schools in the state of Illinois are adequately funded, to make sure that schools of Illinois are providing the best quality of education for all of the students that they have uh, in their buildings, and to make sure that our communities continue to be safe and sustainable. And we know education is a significant part of making sure that our communities are safe 
and indeed sustainable. So I'm proud to be the House sponsor of Senate Bill 1 uh, and looking forward to continuing this dialogue and having very meaningful dialogue, but working toward passage of this legislation in the House this upcoming session as well. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. I'm joined, I'm happy to be joined here with the rest of the group because once the Senate EFAC committee did its homework, we neglected to respond to the resource piece because we just really wanted to dive into creating the new weighted formula to address um, our neediest districts. Now we're at a place where I'm so happy to see that Senator Menard continued to move um, the subject through the House, and it's wonderful, wonderful to see Representative Davis and all uh, the other House members here because many people wanted to find out what was going on, what's next, what the House is doing, and it's good to see that the House has been busy working. And so um, I'm just delighted to continue to stand in the gap for education funding, education reform, the need to make sure all of our children, no matter where they live in the state of Illinois, have the opportunity to receive a high quality public education. So I commend Senator Menard. Um, the House has work to do. The Senate has work to do with Senate Bill 1. We couldn't have picked a better number. And um, I'm looking forward to um, working with him to move this measure again uh, through the Illinois Senate, this time recognizing the need for those resources. And just quickly to Isby's proposal, I think um, that we still need more funding. Uh, it was good to see that they decided this time to do no proration. I had mentioned to you guys before, although there was an increase in, in funding of the foundation level, it was still prorated at 89%. So taking into account, that the proposal is calling for 61.19 per pupil without proration still isn't enough money in the foundation. Um, if you look at EFAP's report, we should be around 8,600 or so of the like per pupil. So we're quite a ways um, um, under where we should be. And if we actually got to those numbers where we should be, then you, you would really see this working. You would really see the difference in what adequate funding um, could make and, and, and the changes that could really take shape in our public school system. So I'm just here to be a part of, of the team that's trying to make sure that all of our kids get a fair shot in Illinois. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am also delighted to be here. Uh, this is a, a bill, uh, this type of bill that I worked on, even as a community organizer, to actually first met Representative Davis and some other folks here. Uh, so I'm grateful to Senator Menard, grateful to Representative Davis for bringing this forward. Um, I've said before that I believe that this is the civil rights issue of our time access to a high quality public education and that um, the idea of somehow dealing with only adequacy and not equity would be very similar to the foolish man who built his house upon the sand because if we do equity, then we are able to get to adequacy more easily uh, and able to ensure that the kind of resources are coming from the state to make sure that every child, regardless of their zip code, has access to a high quality education. So I'm honored to be here. I know there are some who've said, well, you know, the House didn't participate in EFAC or, uh, you know, there's this resolution saying let's slow down the process and, and start over again. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here. We don't need a blue ribbon commission. And I, you know, participated in some of those EFAC hearings and so did some House Republicans. So we know what the data says. We know what Massachusetts and other states who have done this well are doing. And the time to do this is right now. So I'm honored to be standing with my colleagues, very grateful uh, for the opportunity, and I believe we're going to get this done. Thank you. First, I wanted to just thank everyone who took the time out of their day to be here. Um, I'm Representative Sue Shear, for those of you who don't know me. Thanks. First and foremost to Senator Menard for having the courage to start this a long time ago and to all of our other representatives and senators for, for being willing to stand up and do the right thing. This is an issue, our fair school funding has been an issue in teachers' hearts for as long as I was a teacher, which I started teaching in 1978. Remember the first time I ever voted was voting for a school referendum indicator and seeing how important that was at that time. And in some ways, I can't believe that we're still fighting to get fair funding in the state of Illinois. 
I think the name couldn't be any more appropriate than to be fair school funding. Because when I think about this, I laid awake last night thinking, I just visited um, a high school yesterday in Project Read. And, and when I was sleeping, and then I woke up and I thought, you know, is it fair? Is it fair? Is it fair that some kids get a computer in their classroom and some don't? Is it fair that we all pay taxes for our children to get an education, but we don't get the same fair education? Is it fair that we're all asked to take state examinations where the results are published in the newspapers, and yet some of our students have books and some don't? Some have a library and some don't. Some have computers and some don't. But do we acknowledge any of that when we publish the results? I can answer as a teacher. No, we don't acknowledge that. Is it fair that when our kids go to take the examinations to get into college and take the ACT, that some kids had a computer and some didn't? That some can afford a calculator and some can't? Is it fair that some kids get to eat breakfast and some don't? We have a sense of fairness here. And it's been long too far ignored. And to the courage of the people who stand behind me, I say amen and hallelujah that the time has finally come that we can straighten out the fairness in the way we fund education, and the fairness in the way we look at what's important in the state of Illinois. What do we want out of our youth? Do we want to tie our teachers' hands behind their backs? Do we want to say, OK, we can't afford computers, but you go make sure that they can pass a Common Core test? We're going to give them the same length of time to take the test as someone who has a computer at their desk and 20 sitting in the corner and a computer advisor in the room making sure that everybody's computer's working. I taught in one of those schools just a couple years ago. We had two labs with 24 computers and I had 26 students. And a couple computers were broken all the time. Now, as a teacher, what are you going to do? And you know that your child in your classroom is going to take the same test as the child who's in a classroom with 30 computers for 20 students and 20 extra over in the corner. There's just no fairness to any of this equation. And it's time that everyone step up to the plate. And let me be very clear. I don't want any student in the state of Illinois or anywhere in the United States or the whole world for that matter to suffer with what privileges they have. I just want the playing field to be fair. I want the children from my classroom to have every opportunity to compete to get into the University of Illinois as anyone else in the state of Illinois. I saw it firsthand when my daughter took the ACT to get into the U of I. And she went to the public schools in Decatur. And she competed with the kids from the suburbs of Chicago. And she still got in. But it was despite the situation, not because of the situation. It's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. And we have to all work together to make it fair and say, guess what? We're going to quit saying education's our priority, and we are going to make education our priority. Because I can't help people get a job when I go help them at Project Read yesterday, and they can't read, and they're 30 years old. Well, I want to be a welder, but I can't read the welding plans. We hire felons, but the felon has to be able to read. There's a reason they became a felon in the first place, because they couldn't learn how to read. And they couldn't re learn how to read because we wouldn't fund chapter reading anymore. We wouldn't fund reading recovery anymore. Is it fair? It's time to make it fair. That's all I can say about it. It's time to make it fair.
right, we have two, uh, two superintendents with us today that are going to uh, say a few remarks. Uh, first is Tony Sanders, who is the CEO of Unit 46 uh, School District, which is the second largest uh, district in the state in Elgin. Tony. Thank you, Senator. Um, actually, I'm, I work for the largest school system in the state of Illinois outside of that one that's just a little bit northwest of us called Chicago. So uh, we're, uh, I'm proud to be the CEO of uh, a school district encompassing 11 different communities, 40,000 students, and I'm here to fully support Senate Bill 1. And I do so not even knowing the impact that Senate Bill 1 will have on our school district. Um, when Senate Bill 16 came forward last year, there was a lot of rhetoric around winners and losers. In the state of Illinois, we've had winners and losers for years and years and years, and it's not school districts, it's kids. Um, if this is done right, I don't have to worry about what the impact will be on my school district. I will know, given our student demographics, 40,000 students, 25% of whom are learning English for the first time, 12% who are special education, 60% of whom are low income. It will have an impact on our school district, but we have to get away from the rhetoric of winners and losers. Again, we've had those for years. Um, I'm proud to be a part of the Funding Illinois Future Coalition, uh, a group of nearly 200 superintendents from across the state who support Senate Bill 1. Um, I will keep my comments brief because I'm in education, not legislation, uh, and just say that the time to change the formula is now. Um, we cannot wait any longer for a fix to, to Illinois school funding formula. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Garrison. I'm a superintendent of Sandoval Community Unit School District 501. And while we're not a large district in the state, we're actually a small rural state located about two hours south of Springfield. But before I share a true problem that we're facing, who better to talk to you than a student from our, our high school who actually is a student board member. So he attends all of our board meetings each month and he brings a student voice to the table. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Cade Gamble, who's a junior at Sandoval High School. Like Dr. Garrison said, my name is Cade Gamble. Good afternoon. Um, I'm a junior at Sandoval High School. Our school district has an enrollment of about 550 students, grades pre-K through 12th grade. And today we are here to talk about a very serious topic concerning many students in Illinois. School funding. Inequitable school funding is a situation plaguing high poverty school districts in Illinois. Without the appropriate amount of funding, high poverty schools are not able to offer an education comparable to wealthier school districts. The education you receive should not be determined by your zip code, but rather by your will and drive to learn. How does the lack of funding affect our schools and communities? In Sandal, we are forced to make cuts to the school budget in order to keep our doors open. We currently do not offer any courses in art or theater or foreign languages. We have a limited variety of vocational skill courses and few electives that many wealthy schools are able to offer to their students. We are down to the bare bones. Sandoval has made cuts to faculty and administration. Extracurricular programs are led by volunteers. Transportation costs have become the community's burden to bear. Teachers are spending their own money on classroom materials and the list goes on and on. A proper education should, op should offer many opportunities, not just a few a school can afford because of the insufficient funding it receives. Benjamin Franklin once said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. So let's follow in the words of Benjamin Franklin and invest in the great young minds in the next generation. I urge you to su support Senate Bill 1. Thank you. And just to put everything into perspective, a real story of what our district is facing. We have cut over 20% of our teaching staff. We have cut over 20% of our non-certified staff. Building level administrators, we've cut 50%. Uh, central office staff, we've cut 50%. The, the dilemma we're facing, faced with is we're living what I call paycheck to paycheck or state aid payment to state aid payment. And this past year, our boiler that heats our elementary went down. Now the Board of Education is forced with the conversation. We've already cut, again, 20%, 20%, over 50% of different staff. So now the conversation is we don't have a savings. We don't have a fund balance left. How do we find $78,000 so we have heat in our elementary? The next two months, our school board, along with our staff, will be having these hard conversations. 
So again, that just puts things in perspective that $78,000 might not sound a lot to districts with a healthy fund balance, but for us, a situation like that, this is catastrophic, and we, we just keep pulling together, and I can't say enough about the school board, the community, my teaching staff, that they are behind Senate Bill 1. We are behind at equity and adequacy, but the high poverty districts need funding, and we do not have time to wait. So we ask for both our senators and representatives to make Senate Bill 1 a reality this year. Thank you. So in just a couple of closing remarks, we're here early in the session. Uh, we have a uh, bill in both the House and the Senate that has been filed in its entirety, which is important, uh, not just to keep discussions moving forward, uh, but to make sure that discussion is part of both uh, the, the legislative process and the budget process uh, this fiscal year. Again, what is important to us is, is twofold. Changing the formula to uh, reflect the needs of the state today and investing more money in the state budget behind that formula so that we can begin to phase in these changes in the coming school year because there are hundreds of districts that are in the same boat as what we just heard in the state. And those are districts that today lose money year to year despite the fact that more money is invested in the state budget in public education. Those are districts that are victims of today's formula. And those are districts that oftentimes, almost all the time, have higher than average poverty rates, higher than average tax rates. They are making their effort on the local level, but the formula today does not recognize the changes that they've experienced on the local level in the past 17 years. That's why this is so important, to change the formula and invest more at the same time. So with that, I'll be happy to, I think all of us would be happy to answer any questions you have. Carrie. Yeah, we, we expect that um, the modeling from the state board would be released in the near future. Um, that's probably the most vague way I could have just said that, but, um, but they're working on it. Um, we've worked cooperatively, our staffs, both the House and the Senate, uh, with the State Board of Education. Uh, they have any number of things going on right now, um, including a, a budget address in a few weeks and um, a changeover at the state board. Uh, but I, I would think it would be uh, okay for me to say that they'll be here shortly. Uh, but to the point of winners and losers, which has been made um, several times, um, we have winners and losers this year. Uh, despite the fact, again, we invested more in the state budget, there are districts that lost money from the state, and those are the districts that I would argue can least afford to lose state aid. So I want to caution again about printouts. Uh, because we proposed a bill in the Senate, in Senate Bill 16, based on what we think is good public policy for the state of Illinois moving forward. So to me, um, you know, we've had this debate about adequacy and equity and which one should come first and, uh, you know, which one should come second. Uh, I think we are saying in a resounding voice that we ought to do them both at the same time this year because the situation calls for that. It calls for us as legislators to do it. So despite the fact that we're going to have printouts in, in a week or two weeks or three weeks, I think this is a good bill. And I think it's a better bill because it reflects input from educators across the state. Yeah, it's, I, I would describe it as an open, uh, open positive conversation. Um, I, I, I don't speak for the governor uh, by, any, by any means, but, but I leave conversations with the governor and his staff that they understand that the uh, inequity that we face in public education between the haves and the have-nots is, is a great challenge. I would also say this, um, you know, we can't solve this without also addressing budget issues in a macro sense in the state. I mean, we can't solve school funding without addressing core issues in the state budget. One's not gonna happen without the other. And I think that's an acknowledgement on our part as we begin the session. Well, I'm going to speak for myself on this one, um, and then anybody else can chime in if you want. But um, I, I would say we should put all options on the table um, for a couple reasons. We, we face, uh, I use the word dire, and I think people that know me and know the sponsors 
co-sponsors of the bill in the legislature, we don't use words like that often unless they're deserved. And in this case, I believe it's deserved. We have dire situations when it comes to uh, financial decisions that are being made by school boards right now. They, they didn't get better over the last year. They got, they got worse. So to me, that calls for a discussion that puts options on the table. Uh, number two, I don't know of anybody who ran for office for the legislature or for, the, for governor that said, I'm going to go to Springfield and cut schools. So everybody's walking in the door on the same page when it comes to increasing investment, which is something that, that people here, Leader Lightford, for example, has been saying for years, that we need to increase what we spend, increase investment, and at the same time spend it better. And that's what we're saying today. And Senate Bill 1, we believe, is the path forward on that. But again, simply spending more doesn't solve the problem. We, sh we should reiterate that. And evidence by the budget this year, evidence by the budget this year where there was a fight in the House and the Senate to increase spending on public education, which we did, which was enacted on July 1st, but the poorest districts lost money. The poorest districts under that scenario lost money. That's an equation that, that every educator and every legislator, regardless of the district they represent or the school that they walk into every day, should just reject on its face. That should just be rejected on its face. So, so that's the discussion we should have. Invest more, change the formula. Andy, can you, <coughs> excuse me, Senator, can you explain that? I mean, people are going to hear this and go, well, how does that work? Yeah, it's not. It's, it's not logical, right? It's illogical. Right. But, but that's the world that our school districts live in today. Um, and it's simply a filter, Terry. So, so how you spend your money is important. And the directions on how money gets from the state budget to the hundreds of school districts in the state almost uh, acts as a filter to preventing the neediest districts from accessing the money that they need the most. And that's a function of the law, which is why this is not just a budgetary conversation, but it's a conversation about what the law says. So I'm of the opinion that the inequity is hardwired into the law today. Is it a question of deregulating and, and getting rid of mandates? No, it's, it's a question of saying that we value, um, we, we value in, our, in our directions for how money is distributed the fact that we have inequity that exists today in the state uh, to the extent that it never has. So we need to value that more in our directions. So Senate Bill 1 is simply changing the directions on how money is distributed. And, and that, to me, should reflect the needs of the state today, which are very different. Um, you know, anybody listening or anybody in the room, just think about the changes in the state since 1997. Things have changed sizably, and uh, our state aid formula has literally not changed at all. Yeah, can I just add something to that real quick? T Terry, I think it's also just kind of a proportion question. So, you know, there were some districts under SP 16 that said, hey, you know, we could lose, you know, 70% of our state funding under this. Well, but if it's only 2% of your entire funding, then it doesn't hurt you as hard. So part of the problem is under proration, uh, which, you know, we've had for many, many years, um, districts that are in the lowest quintile, um, get hurt five times as much as districts in the highest quintile by proration. So because of that, because of how much your reliance on state funding matters and varies differently between districts, that's why some districts get hurt so much more than others. Senator, I don't see any lawmakers who are Republicans who are from what you might call the wealthier areas. How are you going to sell them? Assuming you, you, you would even need them. Well, this, this uh, clearly has to be a bipartisan effort. Um, I, would, I would go back to the EFAC effort in the Senate where there were eight members of the Senate, four Democrats, four Republicans who signed a report which led to the drafting of Senate Bill 16. Um, but moving forward, it, it's clear to me that, that this has to be a bipartisan effort. There's shared government today in Illinois. Uh, there's there's a, a Republican in the executive branch. There's still Democrats that, um, that hold sizable majorities in both the House and the Senate. Uh, but, but we should make this a bipartisan effort. Uh, I don't think there's too many um, people in the building, Democrat or Republican, that think that the way we do things today is, is worth preserving. So that brings about the question, how are we going to change it and how do we get there? Yeah, you think you've changed it enough to get just name and name somebody like Matt Murphy on board with <laughs> I'm not sure if this is going to do that trick, but... <laughs> But, but uh, w this should be a bipartisan effort. You know, if, if, uh, 
if if we can advance a bipartisan bill uh, that that Governor Rauner can sign to begin to make these changes in this coming school year, that that to me ought to be our goal. That's my my personal goal. I think that's the goal of the the sponsors in the House and the Senate. But that calls for bipartisan action. That also calls for engagement in a discussion. And you know, simply saying that we're going to resist change for the sake of resisting change isn't going to get us the, 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 to the place where we need to go, in my opinion. So um, you know, th there's a lot of ideas. And I would say to my colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisle, in both chambers, let's, let's hear them. How do, we, how do we change that? First, let's recognize that's a problem. Second, how do we, how do we change it? I think so. You know, I don't. I don't speak for. I don't speak for anybody other than myself. But um, I mean, universal. It, do they recognize? Do people universally, not just Republicans, but within the legislature, is there a broad consensus that we do have a funding problem that brings about inequity? I, yeah. I mean, you, every. You would be hard pressed to find a, a, a statistic or a study that says that the way we do it today is worth worth keeping. Nobody's saying that. Um, I don't know of anybody in the legislature that's saying that the system, the status quo, is is just uh, is something that we ought to just keep around because it's really working well. Um, I don't hear anybody saying that. Uh, obviously, how to fix it brings about, you know, a lot of debate, which it ought to. Um, Senate Bill 1 is is prescribing and recommending sizable changes to how we how we fund schools in the state. I th happen to think they're appropriate changes, uh, but, but we should have that discussion. But, but simply not uh, showing up to the conversation is never going to get at the solution to so many problems we face in the state today, which, which the members have articulated, whether it's unemployment or, you know, um, you name it. All these things relate to what, what we think is greater equity and greater access to opportunity in public schools. That requires a change in the funding formula and more investment. Senator, the way I understand it, those of us who have been mothers could tell you that you're pregnant for nine months, you're in labor for 12 to 24 hours, and you have a baby. This is your third year of living with this. What gives you confidence that someday there will be something with 10 fingers and 10 toes and 10 toes? Well, if you, if you look at history, Dave, um, um, the, the cards are stacked against us. Uh, if you look at if you look at uh, the fact that there's been action on this for years, and um, there's been an aversion to a difficult conversation, which I think is just human nature, um, I think one would say that that we have our work cut out for us, and that's clear to me. Uh, but but this is a daily conversation. You know, Will and I we talk constantly about this. I talk to uh, minimally a superintendent a day about this bill. It's a daily conversation. And uh, acknowledging that we have a severe problem to solve, uh, to me, is a tremendous step forward for the state, uh, which is different than the conversation that was being had just a few years ago. So I feel like we're inching toward a solution. I feel like the language that we filed today is progress toward that. But now we have to have this conversation about uh, this bill and investment in public schools and we have to incorporate ideas to try to bring about uh, a bipartisan coalition in both the house and the senate does it have to when you talk about the i think you said 500 million dollar million dollars uh, attached to this at a, at a minimum is that new spending or is that rearranging the dollars we have maybe taking money out of some of the money we're spending on medicaid and to what extent do any of the members of the legislature want to make that value proposition to say we've got to take money out of pot A to put it in pot B? I think that'd be part of the budget debate, Terry. I think that, um, I, again, that's why we want to do this now. You know, we have a state of the state address coming tomorrow. We have a budget address coming two weeks after that. And we want to have this conversation now uh, because we all value it. And we think that we have an opportunity to fix it this year. Uh, so I would say that has to be part of the, the budget conversation moving forward. Go ahead. 
just even to that point, I don't think uh, I've never shied away from the conversation about revenue. It's always an important part of what I do. Um, but the $500 million that the senator is talking about, let's take, for instance, uh, what was in the last General Assembly, uh, House Bill 390, which was a corporate loophole closure bill, which reportedly would uh, gain the state about $500 million. So it's simply just saying that all options have to be on the table in the conversation about where revenue is. Uh, it becomes tougher when you're talking about, say, taking money from Medicaid and putting it toward education. Certainly becomes a much tougher conversation. And again, that, as the Senator indicated, it will be a part of the budget address. But there have been opportunities to put more revenue on the table. So for those who are saying, where's that money going to come from? You know, what was House Bill 390 could be one of those places where additional money could come from if we're willing to stand up and enact what would be tough pieces of legislation because the business community wouldn't necessarily want to see that happen. But when we have businesses who are in the state of Illinois who are not even paying Illinois taxes, we all have to say there's something wrong with that. And that creates the conversation and the dialogue to try to move the revenue piece of this forward along with the reform aspect of it. Down here for this. Thanks for driving down. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it was good. I love that.